work it, make it, do it, make sense. Welcome everyone. Not many people, but I promise it's going to be quick and interesting, so you can run to lunch still. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about Hibernate OGM, uh, in particular about the new developments we had to integrate OGM with uh, in-memory data grid, and I am part on the Infinispan team. So two words about myself. Uh, I've been contributing to Hibernate since almost 10 years now. I've been doing many things. I have like a passion on performance and scalability, so I was also very interested in the Infinispan project. Uh, which started eight years ago, and I was contributing back then already. And uh, so now it seems like I was the best person to integrate actually Hibernate with Infinispan as a data store, not just as a caching technology. So I think, I hope you all know already about Hibernate, and since we just have 15 minutes, we're just going to hope you do. <laughs> and so Typically, you know Hibernate as like the gateway or like the, the API, the, the middleware between your applications to your relational databases. Now, technically, in your Java API, there is really nothing to do with Java, with, uh, sorry, with SQL, and you already see that like with all the complexities that you're facing with Hibernate, it really is about the fact that the Java objects and the SQL world are really, really different. So the conceptual, change of flipping from a relational database to just any kind of database over there um, is actually, from a point of view of API or Hibernate user, doesn't actually change much. Like, if you look at, like, the JPA specification, okay, there is, like, a create a native query, but it's just saying it's native. It's not saying this has to be, like, valid SQL or anything like that. Like, so if you look at all the annotations on the specifications, there are some things which hint that there might be tables behind this thing. And actually, most NoSQL stores uh, call things like or tables or caches or groups or documents or things which actually map conceptually quite well. Now, what we also noticed is like in, uh, uh, in some NoSQL categories, like uh, graph databases, graph databases actually match your Java objects quite better than a relational database because what you have in memory is objects which are related to other objects, and you're trying to map these to some kind of different store. This mapping is hard. But when it comes to like a, a graph database, it's, it's the same stuff. So that maps pretty well. Um, so what are we talking here about? Is it like an ORM for NoSQL? Well, um, we call it OGM because we started as an object grid mapper. We were focusing on Infinispan in embedded mode. That was like the first experiment we did about five years ago. Now running Infinispan in embedded mode is pretty much having a big hash map, which has high availability and failover across different nodes. What's new about the recent development is we're not only using Infinispan in embedded mode, which is essentially storing your data in the same heap as an application, but separating concerns, which is now uh, something that people like in the microservices hype to have a database back to a separate thing. And um, so what, we're, what I'm presenting today is totally new in the late last versions of uh, AGM, which was released a couple of months ago. So, Getting back a bit on the Hibernate family, uh, you might know it as Hibernate ORM, but it's actually a bit of a portfolio of uh, different projects interacting with data. We know Hibernate ORM, uh, which is like the flagship project. You know it uh, quite well. There is a Hibernate Search, which is a really cool extension to allow you to do like better full text uh, queries on top of your model. We integrate with uh, Lucene and uh, now with Elasticsearch as well. We have plans to integrate other search engines. We have Hibernate Validator, which is not so much about persistence, but it's very related to your data, like making sure that the stuff you're storing is, is valid data. And it is, of course, the reference specification for uh, the bean validation standard. <laughs> now, Hibernate OGM is the new project we're talking about here. And just to make it really quick, uh, what it is about, I'm going to show you straight away some running code. Now, using an idea, this resolution is not going to be very easy. But essentially, this, what I'm showing here, is actually a unit test, an integration test from the Hibernate OGM source code, the project itself. So if you can want to check it out from GitHub, you can import a project in your favorite IDE, you'll have the same thing that I'm about to run now. Now, what we have in this class, this is an integration test using Archelian, 
Archelian means we can, uh, we have like the shrink wrap component which allows me to define uh, a deployment. And we are uh, deploying a couple of beans and a configuration file for Hotrod, which is the client to connect to Infinispan, and we are defining a persistence XML. Now this is a DSL, but it's generating essentially the same XML format, which is the deployment for a persistence XML on the server. What I like about having a DSL is that since it's programmatic, we can you know, invoke methods on different tests and make changes dynamically without having actual uh, source code, uh, like hard-coded configurations. So what you can see here is this first property we're setting, this is a Hibernate search configuration because since we're using a key value store, there is no search engine. So as an alternative to search engine, we want to use Hibernate search to be able to find data after it's stored. I'm setting this in memory just for, uh, because it's a test, of course. And then we set the data store provider for OGM. We want to use Infinispan remote. And then we have to, this is not visible, sorry. Try to expand a bit. So there is this other property for OGM, um, which is going to set which client configuration, so how to connect to the data grid. This is the replacement of the data source. If you see here, there is no data source configured in this uh, configuration file. And then, well, we have one additional, this is a technical detail to uh, make sure that the OGM libraries are actually exposed to your application when running on Whitefly. So technically, what's happening here is you're running a JPA application, we're running it on Whitefly, and there is absolutely nothing new in terms of uh, uh, like mind-blowing setup other than setting the two properties here, which are, I want to use OGM, that's here in the provider. This actually is the same thing as Hibernate ORM, just with some additional extension points, which enable the NoSQL capabilities. And then, of course, there is no data source, and we replace this with here. Now, if you look at the, the parent class, this is an actual enterprise Java bean which will get deployed and does some data operations on the database. Now the good, the, the interesting thing is that this bean is extended by various different configurations so that OGM can test that this same uh, set of operations will work on a relational database and on other data stores like we have support for MongoDB and uh, I forget, like uh, Neo4j, there, there are several uh, other alternatives. So what's nice here, if I run it, our integration test suite setup is quite extensive. So here it's running a Wi-Fi server. It has been packaging our just being built uh, test. It's being deployed. And then it's also running here. It's also starting an Infinispan server instance as in a separate JVM. And here we are saying, OK, the cache manager is now running. Then it's deploying our application, which is using these magic cards. It's creating a protobuf schema, which we're going to see now, and the protobuf encoders, which are needed to encode your data in a specific format for the hot rod client. And it's going to use this to actually run the test suite. And that's all I have to show, because we don't really have much time. So now I'm going to go quickly back to slides to explain what's actually going on behind the scenes here. Um, but really, if you want to replicate this, you know, it's just a Maven project, you import it, you will run it. It will automatically set up Whitefly, set up the data grid, and run a, shovel in all the dependencies and run the configuration. So I think I've given you a good starting point to try something out. So what is this all doing? Um, well, first off, you should never serialize an object within your key value store. So even if it's a key values thing, if you are serializing your objects as they are and then you make any change, then you are not going to be able to read your data back. So you need to use these protobuf encoders, which are like the standard format used in, uh, in, uh, in Hotrod, which is the wire protocol to, use to talk to Infinispan. And this protobuf stuff, actually looks a bit scary because, uh, well, it's not that scary, but it's a new thing that you have to learn and you have to generate, this is like an example mapping. You have to create these objects and, um, sorry, these text files which represent your schema and you have to deploy them. So it's pretty much like a schema in a relational world. The difference is fundamental that this is not representing how your data is stored on the server. This is representing the wire format of your messages. So this is about what you are sending back and forth to the server, which means like here in this hypothesis entity, we have to 
fields like description and votes, these are optional, even if maybe they are required on your object. The thing is, if you then want to do like a select statement and just fetch IDs from the server, you wouldn't be able to just fetch an ID without the description and the votes fields if they are mandatory. So to be able to run all the queries, you pretty much want to have these components like optional, and uh, we need to be able to encode all the types, the Java types, into Protobuf. So this is all stuff that Hibernate OGM is taking care of automatically. Then, of course, we have the client initialization and management. You don't have to learn how to bootstrap uh, the hot rod client and how to do pooling of connections, and especially which component of your framework is going to make sure that this is started and stopped and all that. Because, well, the, the good thing is, like, since this is the real hybrid ORM, any framework that you're using which is able to bootstrap Hibernate, you just have to add the additional dependencies, and it will know how to start this. You just have to add the additional properties and the OGM extension. So your framework already knows how to manage the connections to the server and uh, the data grid and all that. Um, well, compared to using Hotroad directly, Hotroad directly would essentially give you an API which is puts and gets. You can use some batching, but it gets quite complex, and you cannot map any relations, uh, like exception handling is totally different, and so I think there this helps a bit. It doesn't do sequence generation, so if you need IDs to be generated, that's going to be a really tough piece of code that you have to write, because it is just a map, and it can support some atomic operations, but the atomic operations, you need to learn about the specific semantics, and the specific semantics actually vary depending on the configuration you're using. So there are some combinations which are just not valid, and you're just going to generate duplicate IDs, and your data is not going to be very well. Uh, so I would actually suggest to not use this feature and you know, just use uh, application assigned IDs, which are the most efficient in this case, but if you want to migrate or just ease of use and get started and have the application to use auto-generated IDs, uh, OGM knows how to do that. And then relations. If you have foreign keys, uh, everybody has foreign keys. I think we're a bit spoiled in the relational world because they just work. We have integrity checks, we, we know when something is going wrong, it, the database will take care of us not doing any mistakes. All these safety bells that we are spoiled with, they are gone when you're using a, like a NoSQL store which doesn't have referential integrity checks. So you have to write your code to make sure, like if you're not using OGM, to make sure that all the different relations are always uh, consistent. And well, to be fair, that's just really boring and we all have something better to do. So it's good to have a framework which, like ORM, knows since many years how to do it because it does it on the database. You have to write things in the right order. And we do the same on, on here. So to wrap it up here, uh, I've been using InfiniSpan a lot. Uh, it's very flexible because it can be tuned like crazy to get really high performance out of it. The, the downside of all these tuning options and flags and advanced APIs which are in there is that you can really hurt yourself, like do something totally wrong because there is a little misunderstanding of, of what an API's effect actually is going to be in a concurrent environment or in a large scale environment. So what I think I'm giving with OGM is really like hard coding, my experience in there, like if you need to store these things in this specific way, uh, we have been testing carefully, like this is how it should be done, and we work with the InfiniSpan team to make sure that we are actually doing the right thing. We have some more things planned which are not there yet. So at this point, the generated schemas which uh, we are creating, they do not support uh, embedded objects. Like the protobuf actually is more like a document store, so we can embed nested collections in there. And if you have like embeddable collections, we could actually embed them in like the parent object. And this, uh, this is uh, like a nice mapping to have in some cases. Um, Another thing is like, while we can generate the protobuf encoders and the schemas, we cannot actually generate, we cannot connect to the server and define the caches that need to be created to run our application. So you would have to create those in advance, but we're working on now with InfiniSpan team to have new uh, methods that we can call like with a privileged uh, operation to actually create the caches for you. And transactions is coming as well. Transaction is a feature which exists since a long, very long time in InfiniSpan, but only if you run it in embedded mode. Here we're talking about connecting to InfiniSpan over this hot rod protocol. 
in which case you don't have transactions yet. Uh, that should be coming. Uh, they're already working on that. Finally, something that is missing on the OGM component for this specific uh, integration is we do not have the translation of queries yet. Uh, we have it for some other backends, like if you're using MongoDB or Neo4j, we can actually translate your JPQL or operations into the native uh, query language. And criteria operations are not supported on any system yet, but they will come when Hibernate ORM6 arrives because we are actually rewriting the whole strategy of generating queries uh, within the engine. The main reason is actually to get like crazy performance optimizations doable on the relational database world, but OGM is going to benefit uh, to get the chance of actually converting criteria and GPQL to native queries. That's all I had, and we're a bit short. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Was I going too fast, too many complex concepts? Is there going to be a major rewrite So the API is going to be exactly the same, because it's a standard specification, right? But what we do internally, yes, it's a major rewrite. It's a massive amount of work. What's actually happening is now today, behind the scenes, it's like generating snippets of strings, and then these get appended and sent to the database in hope that the database will know how to optimize that. What we're doing now is actually have a semantic query parser, and we're building a semantic tree which is expressing the intent of the operation, which means that different dialects for different relational databases will be able to have something more like a compiler strategy, so that we can actually generate entirely different style of operations to push the performance to the maximum. So, so the existing criteria yeah. looks very relational. Um, yeah. So does that mean that it has to be a lowest common denominator sort of query support for the non-secret databases? Or that you can support the criteria? Yes, that's a very good question. So he, he He's asking if I can summarize it, if we will be able to express all the complex and advanced relational features that the Criteria API is, are exposing, which are very much relational in nature, and map those on all the NoSQL stores. Uh, probably no. Uh, we, have, we have several ideas to explore. One of them is to include uh, uh, TEED, which is an open source project behind uh, JBoss data virtualization. TEED is pretty much able to, to transform any kind of source in a relational engine and be able to run SQL uh, operations on it. Um, like we have like customers using it to you know, connect uh, spreadsheets uh, to CVS files on other files which are on FTP and people can query this using SQL. Um, and it has a really clever optimization engine in there. So that might be a way, of course, if you're if you need really relational kind of analytics, you wouldn't use a Kibelu store. Right? So that's a bit of the thing. And I think the holy grail is going to be uh, like having a hybrid storage, so that you would be able to have your model partially mapped on like a Kibelu store and partially mapped on a different system, so that you can pick like this section of the data is, bet is best served by, let's say, MongoDB, for example. And, and you mix the different things as a matter of configuration, really. Yeah. Yeah. We're good. Um, if you have any more questions, I'll be around. And I'm mostly at the Red Hat booth, but I'll be walking around with everybody. Thank you very much.